Greetings, brethren. Greetings. This is uh, Philip Shields, your brother in the family of God, with a two-part sermon topic I hope will change your life and mind. Have you in the past year or two had the privilege to watch a spectacular, instant, undeniable, miraculous healing of a major health problem like someone dying of cancer be instantly healed? Or watch a large tumor, cancerous tumor, disappear before your very eyes? Or watch a lame man from birth jump up? Or talk to a dead woman who's been resurrected right there before your eyes? Or delight in a conversation with a man blind for years and years? and suddenly be able to see. Have you, brethren? Our Savior promised that if we believe, we will do even greater works than He did. That's in John fourteen twelve. Let that sink in. Even greater works than He did, which I just kind of listed some of them, or similar ones to those that He did, or the apostles did. Where are they? I believe in healing. I've been healed spectacularly myself at times. I've been involved in some spectacular healings when I prayed for others. But for the most part, we're not seeing a lot of these and neither am I. Why is that? We read about them in Jesus' day and in the book of Acts. So what's happened to resurrections, instant healings, shadows that cause a healing, miracles galore? I've heard a lot of excuses why we're all okay and nothing to worry about. But I'm not convinced that God has put His healing powers on hold or has lost them. I don't think the problem is with Yahweh. So that's going to be our topic today, why and when God heals according to His own word. I've heard a lot of excuses why the promise Yeshua made that if we ask anything in His name, it will be done. John 14, verses 13 to 14. John 15, verse 16. John 16, verses 23 and 24. He said, you've never been asking my name till now. Start doing that, because when you ask in my name, it shall be done to you. Brethren, if you absorb the depth of what it means to be in Him, not just God in us, but we in Him, and praying in Yeshua's name uh, takes on new meaning. Uh, But still, I know it has to be according to God's will, I know we have to believe. I know there have to be other moving parts to all of this. But surely we should be seeing many, many, many more healings than we are. Again, brethren, the problem is not with Yahweh. Surely not. For He calls Himself, in fact, our healer. And He wants to pour out His blessings. As a good friend of mine in New York wrote me, God is not a stingy God. He's more generous than we can imagine. If we don't fully realize the power we have available to us through Him, we won't use it or know how to use it. And we aren't experiencing our, experiencing our lives to the fullest potential. That's a quote, end quote. I can't agree more. There is the story of one of the kings in Second Kings 13. Second Kings 13, verses 15 to 19, when uh, I think it was Elisha had gone to see him, and he was asked to shoot an arrow uh, through the window and then to strike the ground. And he, after he struck the ground the first time, uh, he said he would have victory over Syria and so on. But he only struck the ground three times, and the prophet Elisha got very angry because the king uh, didn't seem to realize the potential of what he had or didn't understand. They could have had far more victories over Syria, represented by the number of strikes that he hit the ground. Read this story. If it is there to tell us something, God hasn't changed. We have not, for we ask not. We don't have because we don't ask, at least not believing fully, according to the book of James. Wouldn't you have loved, brethren, to have been present for some of the most powerful and moving healings of the Bible? What would you pay to have had a front row seat at Lazarus' resurrection? To watch the Son of Man command a corpse that had been now dead for four days to come out of the tomb? To feel the awe and excitement, perhaps even initial fear, to watch Lazarus come to life. I don't think you and I can really imagine it. To feel the skepticism in the air by some as the stone closing the tomb was rolled away and then to curl up your nose as the decaying stench of his death 
hit your nostrils. <clears throat> Nothing stinks more than a dead body. But wait, Jesus is saying something. Lazarus, come forth! What? Has Yeshua lost his mind? Helping the blind to see is one thing, but this man's been dead long enough that the stench of death still hangs in the air. And then to feel the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end and chills run up your spine and your back as, what is this? Something's moving in there. Is that decaying corpse moving? Wow! He's trying, trying to stand up. You you look at one another. You look back at Jesus who has a warm smile now as he orders someone to please unwrap the man who wants to leap and shout for the dead man, Lazarus, is once again alive. Brethren, besides Lazarus, there were so many hundreds of other healings. This young man in his early thirties, Yeshua of Nazareth, flesh and blood, who claimed he could do nothing of himself without his father's power, was out there healing the sick, raising the dead, letting the blind see, the lame leap like a deer, the mute could sing. How exciting that would have been to have witnessed. But wait. We could be witnessing it. We should be witnessing it. Far, far more than we are. Many of you will disagree with that last statement. I contend it's biblical. So have you seen anything like that lately? Where have all the many healings gone? Our Savior Yeshua, or you say Jesus, said that those who believe in him would see signs that follow, including you shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall be made well. Mark 16 verse 17 and 18. When he sent his disciples out by twos, part of their commission was to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Luke 9, verse 2. So where are all those healings? We see some, but not as many as we should be seeing. Welcome to today's message, brethren. This is Philip Shields with a very important message that could help us understand why we see less miracles than we are and how we can see more spectacular healings and miracles in the months and years ahead. Our Creator, in fact, claims to be our healer. If you diligently, he says in Exodus 15.26, <clears throat> excuse me, just a second. He says in Exodus 15.26, if you will diligently hear my voice and heed my voice of Yahweh, he says, and do what is right in his sight, Exodus 15.26, Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. <clears throat> I will put none of these diseases on you which I brought on the Egyptian. Also notice um, who brought the diseases. It was God. Who brought them onto the Egyptians? It was God. Satan gets a lot of blame, and rightly so. But a lot of diseases are actually a matter of God being involved in them. Certainly God is always allowing them when we have them. He says, for I am Yahweh who heals you. So he says, I will put none of the diseases that I, that I Yahweh, brought onto the Egyptians. David, under inspiration, penned this for us. And I'll say Yahweh where it says the Lord. There's no the in Yahweh in the original Hebrew. In Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3. Bless Yahweh. Just a minute here. I just lost something here. He says, Bless Yahweh, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Okay? What are they? Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Now, why would that even matter? Well, the fact is, though we will all someday die... It seems too many of us are dying prematurely or living with horrific health issues that go unhealed. I'm not saying that Yahweh is bound to heal all His children all the time. I am not saying that, brethren. But what I am saying is some, let's, let's hear some of the other reasons. Sometimes someone suffers to accomplish some aspect of His will, like the man who was born blind from birth. And the disciples said, who sent him, he or his parents? And he said, neither one. Sometimes even the very righteous men die of an illness 
uh, though God may have used them to, in fact, heal others, such as Elisha. It says that he was sick and of a, a disease of which he would die. Second Kings 13, verse 14. And we will all die of natural causes, including old age, if the Messiah doesn't return in the next 20 to 50 years. Isaac and Jacob and others were simply cases of old age resulting in blindness. Both, uh, both righteous men, but they got so old that they couldn't even pro properly see. Ditto for the prophet Ahijah, 1 Kings 14.4, who was blind by reason of age, it says. Um, King David couldn't get warm in his final weeks. Timothy had frequent infirmities. Why didn't Paul just heal him? Trophimus was left in Miletus sick and not healed. 2 Timothy 4.20 And all of them, including Paul, including Peter, all of them have died. If Messiah doesn't return soon, all of us will someday die as well. We won't be healed endlessly and live forever in this life. So please understand that I understand that. On the other hand, God can keep one strong as he did Moses when God took him at 120 years old. Yet the Bible says his eyes were not weak nor his strength gone. Deuteronomy 34, 7. Uh, all these are the scriptures are in the uh, transcript. If you want to go back and study them, and if I'm ru rushing over them too quickly, Caleb at 85 said in Joshua 14, Caleb at 85 said, I'm as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. That was 40 plus years before that. Uh, and I'm as vigorous to go to, out, to go out to battle today as I was back then. My brother pointed these out to me and I agree. Sometimes God may even take one, uh, one very early in life because he sees some reason to do that. He sees the good in this person. Look at this verse my brother sent me. In fact, you should read the whole context in 1 Kings 14, verses 5 to 13. It has to do with wicked King Jeroboam. And uh, his, his wife, who was also wicked, uh, was trying to have Ahijah, the prophet, uh, heal their son who had been sick. So they came to ask him to pray for their sick son, but God was going to let him die, but at least have the honor of being buried properly in a grave. Now listen to this. And here's what God said about the son of wicked King Jeroboam. 1 Kings 14, verse 13. 1 Kings 14, verse 13. But like I said, read the whole context when you have time later. God is going to let him die because in him there is found something good toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Now go figure that one out. Yahweh may not have wanted him polluted. He honored a child, in this case, with death, precious in the sight of the Lord and the death of his saints, it says in one of the Psalms. I think it's Psalm 116 or something like that. I'm not sure where the Psalm is right now, top of my head. But uh, he honored this child with death because death was preferable in God's eyes to growing up in a horribly wicked environment had he lived, had he been healed. Isn't that interesting? I, had, I hadn't thought of that one, but my brother uh, reminded me of that, and I appreciate that. There are many factors, and then we can't know all of God's mind on every case. We just simply can't. And a lot of it we have to take by, by as a means of trusting Him. I know that, and I accept that, I state that. But I think we should still be seeing more healings than we do. I mean verifiable, absolutely no question of healings. I also know very well that sometimes we suffer because God wants us to learn from the suffering. As Paul put it, he was made perfect in weakness. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. The context of what we'll read is Paul asking to be healed three times for his quote-unquote thorn in the flesh. What we're about to read should be remembered for all of us going through any trial. But 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. And he, God, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength, God's strength, is perfected or made perfect in our weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Now, that's, that's a real lesson for us. I take pleasure in infirmities. When you understand that Yahweh is 
doing something magnificent through that infirmity. Instead of us feeling badly about the aches and the pains and the suffering and the, and the numbness and the whatever, Paul said, I take no pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses. Christ's sake, for Christ's sake. For when I am strong, then I, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So brethren, when we're in pain, when we're not being healed, a carnal and normal reaction is to get upset and even angry with God, who is able to heal us. But why isn't he doing more than he seems to be doing? I've felt that frustration too, but we must resist thinking that way. Satan will take advantage of those thoughts, and we need to remember we committed our lives to God. He is in charge of every aspect of your and my life, whether we live or whether we die, whether we're in pain or not, or feeling great. It's all up to Him. It's all for Him. And that's when, uh, you know, it's all for Him that we live and move and breathe and live. All of that's up. It's for Him, not for our own sakes. I also believe sometimes the Eternal is making us stop. He's the one making us stop, making us slow down. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, Psalm 23. Listen to your body. Sometimes even godly activity has to be put on hold if it's frankly time to stop, to rest, to let the body heal, to have some time off. He makes me lie down in green pastures. In green pastures, the sheep want to stand and keep busy, keep busy eating, I think, don't they? So I'm not saying something's wrong every time someone's not healed. Please hear that. God has his reasons for everything he does or decides not to do, and I know that. I want you to know I know that, but even as I address this very important topic of why we can have more healings than we're seeing, and I really believe if the whole church would react to what I'm going to preach in this and the next sermon, I really, really believe we will see a lot more dramatic healings among those who do believe and practice what I'm going to preach here, including me. God is really, really good at being God, knowing what's best for us and when. God is really, really good at being God. He has his reasons for everything he does, and sometimes God decides not to heal, and sometimes it's for his glory and for his good reasons, no matter what we're doing. I understand that, and I want you to know that. He knows what's best for you and me, and we shouldn't try to play God or accuse him falsely. I sure hope I'm not doing that. And so please don't read into my sermon that I'm doing any of that. I'm not. Our lives are about trusting him and in, in all things and through all things. Even when he makes us walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we should fear no evil, knowing he walks with us always in all circumstances, if we but have eyes to see, as Psalm 23 says. In fact, our true peace will come, according to Isaiah 26.3, when we focus and stay our minds on him. Isaiah 26.3 says that you will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is steadfast, for he trusts in you. Whereas the King James says, he whose mind is stayed on you for he trusts in you. So please un please understand, I know this and I preach this, but I still think we aren't receiving enough healings for some very clear reasons we'll get into today and next time. I hope you'll encourage others, in fact, to hear this message if, it's, uh, if, uh, if it ministers to you, if it serves you and helps you. In the end, we should say, since we are his, whether I live or whether I die, I live and die unto the Lord, so be it, praise God. But this is said in the light of the things we'll cover today. I hope that helps. I want to talk to you a little bit now about my own cases. So you know where I'm coming from. Because I think sometimes people say, well, it's easy for you to say that, but, but, but. Well, brethren, let's, let's, let me explain to you a couple of things here that I think you'll find helpful. As I speak, I myself have, it's very visible on the x-ray, a very large 11 millimeter half inch kidney stone going on, very large kidney stone. My urologist wants to also check me for bladder cancer. 
Uh, it hasn't been diagnosed. I don't know that I have it. I don't think I do. But he's concerned about it. So far, I have not been healed of the kidney stone as far as I know yet. But I expect and hope, this is August 1st as I speak this, I expect and hope on August 19 to be told it's a lot smaller or has totally disappeared, and I hope the blood in my urine is gone. Some of you are praying for me, and I thank you for that. Let's see what happens. If any of you hear this, I hope you will, even as you hear it, pray for me. If not, if I'm not healed, then we will deal with the facts on hand and decide what to go with God's blessing and guidance, but we'll see. Brethren, I know our God is the God who heals. I know He still heals. I know there are people still being healed. I have myself been healed miraculously several times in my life. When I was a boy of nine or ten years old, I remember my first impression with personal healing. We lived in the Philippines at the time, and I'd gone through a series of boils. Sometimes I had one, two, or three, but sometimes I remember having seven or eight. I had six or seven one time right across my buttocks, and many times on my legs or my arms or under my armpits until I had a cumulative number 99 of them. At that time, we finally were able to have a Filipino minister make it to our home, and he prayed over me and anointed me with oil. And I remember believing. I was but a child. I never got another boil while in the Philippines after that. In 1992, I was totally healed of diverticulitis, for which I was hospitalized for three days. And in my last colonoscopy, they said there wasn't a trace of any diverticulitis at all. I don't believe diverticulitis just disappears. I could be wrong. But I don't believe it disappears once you have it. Mine is all gone. Some years later, I had a, after that, I had a most dramatic healing that stunned the doctors. All my signs of liver and pancreatic cancer after several tests had disappeared after people prayed with me about this. Without that healing, I surely would have died within a few months. It reminds me of David, Psalm 30, verse 2. O oh, Yahweh, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. So, I have been healed of many things. I have not been healed of many other things. Yahweh has even let me be his instrument to lay hands on people and be a participant in many dramatic healings over the years. I prayed for a woman who hadn't bent over for years and years, and she started doing jumping jacks, and then she bent down and touched her toes within seconds of the amen. Another woman with a large ovarian tumor with a scheduled uh, surgery to remove it found it had just disappeared after her anointing, because I told her, make sure they do another test before they cut you open. And they, they tested her, and it was gone. About 15 years ago, a five-month-old fetus, four months short of a full term, was given almost zero chance of surviving after her cesarean, after being cesarean birth, I mean, but is today a happy, bouncy teenager. God healed her after I prayed for her and anointed her in the incubator. I could go on and on, but I certainly would never claim to have the gift of healing. I'm just like most ministers who've seen a few dozen dramatic healings when God used us as a conduit of His power. But most of us also wish there were many, many, many more healings than we've seen. We've all also seen many not healed after I and others have anointed them. Too many have died prematurely. Why, brethren? Why is that happening? Brethren, oh yes, I could also tell you about some over whom I prayed who died. Many who never got well. One of them was my own little boy, David, for whom I prayed and I thought God had healed him until we found him breathless and blue on our bed. So I'm not trying to say I have a gift of healing. Far from it. I wish I had it. I wish many had it. Or my boy would be 27 years old today. I am grateful that Yahweh gave us a second boy, John, who is now 21. But my impression is strong that we used to see more healings 30, 40, 50 years ago. Certainly the early church in the book of Acts did. I'm just saying that Almighty God heals, still heals, still wants to heal, can heal, wants to heal, will heal, hasn't lost the power to heal, hasn't gone off to a nursing home, hasn't hung up his power to heal on some rack someplace. So why aren't we seeing so many more dramatic healings than we are? 
In fact, what do we see going on? We see people not even bothering to ask for anointing. Not bothering asking others to pray for them. Though Yahweh demands it. Ask for prayers, he says, as well as anointing, that you may be healed. It's in James 5, verses 14 to 17. Call for the elders of the church and let the prayer of faith be given over you. And let them pray over you with anointing oil. And the prayer of faith will raise the sick. And pray for one another that you may be healed. James 5, verses 14 to 17. We hear about details for a funeral for a friend far away. Sometimes we didn't even know anything was wrong so we could pray for him or her. What is going on? <coughs> I hope it's not because some assume the brethren wouldn't care enough to pray. As my brother said, no child of God should ever stand alone, especially in those dark moments of despair. Brethren, I hope this is making you think. We're going to track two now at this point. I meant to do some tracks earlier. Anyway, uh, why, does it, why does this even matter? We, we do need to tackle that. Someone is bound to ask, why does it matter? I'm making you know where I make my tracks here. It matters because there are too many little boys and girls, too many of our moms and dads, too many of our very own brothers and sisters, too many of our very closest friends, languishing in pain or confined to a nursing home, unhealed, not being made whole, because, I contend, God is trying to get our attention that something is terribly wrong with the body of God, with the body of Christ, the church. Something can be done about it. Almighty Yahweh is holding back for some very specific reasons and we'll start healing much, we'll start seeing, uh, much more healing more often when that, when the things that need to be changed get changed. So why does it matter? Why does it matter? Because we're going to see prophesied massive epidemics sweeping the world and we're going to have divine protection, we're going to need divine protection and healing. In the 1918 swine flu epidemic, did you know that 100 million people, 100 million people died around the world? 100 million people. The current swine flu epidemic, pandemic, could, not get there, but could become a very bad epidemic, pandemic, or not. We may really need God's healing, brethren. The same Yeshua who walked the earth 2,000 years ago and healed dozens and dozens of people still lives today and still wants to heal us today and can heal us today. Back then, Luke 6 says, Power went out from him and he healed them all. If we're not seeing healing today, it is not because he's lost his power or has retired. No way, brethren. Our Savior lives and he and his Father still want to heal us today. So isn't learning the reasons why he himself says he's holding back one of the most important topics we can discuss? I think it is. Wouldn't it have been great, for example, if your 60-year-old mom didn't have to die of COPD or your 52-year-old brother didn't have to deal with painful and dangerous diabetes? Wouldn't it be nice to know your mom or grandma or aunt will be healed of her crippling rheumatoid arthritis or her kidney failure or your sister be healed of her painful cancer or stroke? Wouldn't it be inspiring to see our children bounce back quickly and be totally healed of their issues as well? I say, yes, we can. So, what can we learn from all this? God may be trying to teach us something in all of our health issues. In our health issues, we should be asking Him to show us gently what it is He wants to teach us. We should ask to be shown where He wants us to grow and thank Him for giving us this opportunity to grow, what he wants us to do. One of the best things about a problem is that it tends to drive us to our knees. And that's always a good thing. So we should note that the trying of our faith is designed to refine us, purify us, strengthen us, mature us as we go through it. So we end up like fine gold of Ophir. It's a shallow person, I've found, who's had a very easy life without trials and problems. So I hope it's clear I'm not saying we should always expect a healing or that something sinful is always at the core of an unhealed issue. I'm not saying that at all. Personal sin could be involved, but I'm not pointing primarily in that direction today. Regardless, we should ask him to reveal himself to us in our trial. 
We should try to hear his voice. I gave a sermon recently on how to hear the voice of God in our lives. I hope you hear that. We should pray as we, as, that we grow closer to him in our sufferings. We ask him to show us what we are to learn in every issue of our lives rather than get discouraged and just hope to die. Don't fight what God is doing or permitting in your life. What he's doing always has a reason and a divine purpose behind it, but we should at least try to know what he's trying to do, try to learn what he's trying to teach us, try to see what he's trying to show us. Do be aware that God permits things, but he's also very willing to change his course as we and his family get in line with what he wants us to see. The Bible is full of examples of that. God was going to destroy Nineveh, and that would have been his will had they remained evil. God permitted Judah's enemies to surround Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat's day. But when Judah and the king repented and fasted and sought God and started praising while they were still in their trial, the course everything had been headed in suddenly changed. That's in Second Chronicles 20. So obviously, if something is going on, God is obviously permitting it. If someone has cancer, God is obviously aware of it. I personally don't like the trend of thinking that it's a cancer demon or a depression demon or this or that. Uh, God may allow demons to certainly afflict us, but God did allow it. And like I showed you in Exodus 15, 26, God even said he put those diseases on Egypt and on Israel if they don't obey. So God is obviously aware of it, permitting it. I may have bladder cancer, even as I speak to you. I could be diagnosed of it, and I could die of it or be healed of it, even after it gives a sermon, or not have it at all. But what am I supposed to learn from this? How can I grow in this? How can I get closer to Him in this? That's what I'm trying to ask God to show me in all of this, and rather than worry or get upset. Having said all that, Yahweh himself tells us things we can do in order to see him intervene more clearly, more often. I'm hoping by the end of the sermon you'll join me in your own faithful, believing, obedient prayer and humbly repent where we need to repent as a church and as a body so God will once again shower his healings upon us much more so than he has been doing. I beg you, brother or sister in Christ listening, do not fall for the trap of thinking there is no problem and thinking that we are okay and that there's nothing wrong that this is normal part for the course, to see as few healings as we're seeing. Please don't fall for that trap either. There's no real problem, you say. That would sound so Laodicean to me. We're fine. We're spiritually rich, increased with goods, in need of nothing. God's obviously blessing us in other ways, you may say. That's so Laodicean. I think we're in need of everything right now, instead of saying we're in need of nothing. Everything. So please be turning with me to Second Chronicles 7. I think as a body we are spiritually naked, destitute, have nothing, spiritually bankrupt in this end time age. I include myself in that. I hope I don't stay in that category forever. I want to see more healings. I want to see God more visibly involved than I perceive we are seeing Him do today. Second Chronicles 7 Verses 12 to 17. And then Yahweh appeared to Solomon by night. Where it says the Lord in the Old Testament. The word the is not even in the Hebrew. It's Yahweh. The eternal. The ever living one. His name is Yahweh. Then Yahweh appeared to Solomon by night. And he said to him, I heard your prayer. And I've chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And when I shut up heaven and there's no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send a pestilence among my people. Did you get that? A pandemic among my people. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. Today we are the temple 
of the living God who dwells inside of us. We are the holy of holies of his presence. The same principle that was sold to Solomon applies to us today. God wants to uh, choose this place, meaning our bodies, for himself as a house of sacrifice, as a house of prayer, as a house of faith. But verse 16, For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, and today that's our bodies, that my name may be there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. So again, God heals. But why aren't we seeing more? And I think we could be seeing a whole lot more being made whole, being look, being 100% fine from head to toe. So I hope this sermon today will get you thinking. Now, one more thing before we get into the reasons. Doctors, surgery, hospitals. It's always a contentious issue. Neither should you take or read into the sermon that I am saying that you should never go to doctors or have a surgery. I'll take Jesus at his word when he said in Luke 5.31, The well do not need a physician, but the sick do. The sick do need a physician. Luke 5.31 Our Savior said the sick need a physician. Sick people need doctors, according to Yeshua, so it's not wrong to go see doctors. I'm seeing a doctor about my kidney stone and the other issues. I have a urologist, but I first was anointed and receiving prayers in my behalf for it. It's, neither, it's not either of, though. I know Yeshua is also speaking spiritually, that there's a spiritual healing <coughs> that has to be... Sometimes we overlook that. The, the physical statement that sick people need a doctor still stands, however. You can't... Ignore that statement. But I know some brethren don't even bother being anointed anymore unless there's nothing more a doctor can do then it's all in God's hands. Oh my! It's super serious. It's so wrong to leave God our healer out of things. Turn with me to Second Chronicles 16, 12. I want you to read this. For example, Asa, king of Judah, got sick and he didn't seek or involve God in it and God faulted him for that. And the fact that he left him out of the picture. In Second Chronicles 16:12, in the 39th year of his reign, Asa, Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Yet his, in his disease he did not seek Yahweh, but the physicians. In his disease he did not seek the Lord, the Eternal, Yahweh, but the physician, what he's saying is only the physicians. What made it wrong for overall righteous Asa was not seeking physicians, was not in the seeking of physicians, but not seeking Yahweh first and primarily by seeking only the physicians. That was the wrong part. If you go back and read verses 7 to 10 in Second Chronicles 16, uh, verses 7 to 10, before we read verse 12, you'll see that Asa was falling down on this matter of relying on God. He relied on the king of Syria instead of God in another incident uh, for protection and all that. And God, is, God isn't God is happy with uh, Asa here. So with the problem with his feet, Asa once again relies exclusively on doctors and not on God our healer at all. And that was the problem. So if you have issues, please, brethren, be talking to the Almighty about that and asking for anointing and getting that done. It is wrong to trust a doctor exclusively and not to rely on God. That goes for any human remedy, including natural remedies, quote-unquote. It's okay to use natural remedies. I am. I do. But, it's, I, but, but always ask God to be in the picture. He's a zealous and jealous God who is our healer. Jeremiah 17.5 said, Cursed is the man, cursed is the man who trusts in a man and makes flesh his strength. So God is our strength. God is our strength. God is our healer. He is our provider and in him we trust. Now one reason we may not be seeing so many healings is that too many are not even bothering to be anointed, to ask for prayers. That's what I'm trying to say. And uh, we're, we're skipping that point. Uh, Jeremiah 17 verse 14 says, Beautifully, heal me, O Yahweh, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. 
for you are my praise. Indeed, they say to me, where is the word of Yahweh? Let it come now. now. So notice the connection, too, between healing and salvation. Anyway, we got to believe enough to still be asking. I don't know for certain, but I just have a gut feeling that a lot of people just don't bother asking for anointing and prayers anymore. That's wrong if that's happening. It breaks God's command to ask. So uh, I think in a way when we don't ask, that certainly is limiting God. But neither is it wrong to see a doctor, okay? I want to make sure that's really clear. So I'm not going down that route. I think some of you would have liked me to have gone down. I'm not going to do it. Paul was called the beloved physician, not the... I mean, Luke was called the beloved uh, physician, not the ex-physician. And I'm sure there are many times that Paul was so happy to have a doctor in attendance after he had been stoned or beaten. It's okay. It's okay to have a physician. Just don't look to them primarily. Now, the usual and more common reasons given... Now let's make that track three now. The usual and more common reasons given for healing... Uh, hang on a minute. Are, are a matter of faith and obedience, and that's certainly true. That those are very, very, very big factors, and there've been wonderful sermons preached over the years on that. And uh, you know those standard answers of lack of faith and obedience tied to the cursings and blessings and cursings chapters of Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. Those messages are real. They're powerful. They're true. If you haven't read. Deuteronomy 28, jot this down. Deuteronomy 28, verses 58 to 63. And Leviticus 26, verses 14 to 16 lately. You should. Leviticus 26, verses 14 to 16. But they don't explain all the reasons why we aren't seeing more healings. Certainly some people are, are not being healed because of sin. But brethren, I think it goes deeper than an individual's own sin. Uh, so get off the kick of assuming someone who's real sick has himself or herself sinned real badly. I will show how, because, you know, I mean, there are some very physically healthy people uh, who are terrible sinners, and there are some righteous people like Elisha who got sick and died of the illness of which he would die, uh, it says in the Bible. Uh, he, he got sick, but Elisha was righteous. He healed, he was used to even heal a lot of people. Paul had his thorn in the flesh, and so, so let's not always assume that. I will show how many times when sin is at the heart of illness, it's often not the afflicted one's sin who caused the illness or the lack of healing, but other sins. It often was not the afflicted one's sins, but other sins. Just hang on to that thought. We have to quit jumping to the conclusion so rapidly that someone not being healed is a terrible sinner. Obviously, the points of faith, or the lack thereof, are huge. Even even Jesus himself could not heal, but except a few in Nazareth, it says in Mark chapter 6, because of their unbelief. Even the Son of God, it says, could not, could not heal, but a few in his own hometown, for their unbelief. Read it for yourself. It's a terrible indictment of his own countrymen. But there's more to it than just faith and obedience. The need for faith and the need to be obedient are two huge, huge points. Yes, true. Well covered. So I want to focus on other points, though, in the rest of the time I have today and in the next sermon. Strap on your belt. We're going to keep moving fast here. So let's move it now to track number four. Examples and teaching straight from the Word, how to have more healings. The first thing, in a way, is a variation of faith. I want to cover it this way, though. Number one, point number one that we can be doing to bring on more healings. Take away the stone and start thanking God for having already heard us even before we see the physical evidence of healing. I'm going to ask you to start thanking God now even though the pain is still there, even though the lump is still there, I want you to start living and believing and thinking as if it's already gone. We all know we should be grateful and express gratitude, but too many of us want to start thanking God only after we see Him heal us. From God's point of view, that's backwards. He wants our faith so strong 
that we thank him even in, during, and for the trial and the pain and the illness, knowing he's working in our lives, knowing he's in charge of things, knowing that God is really good at being God. We don't doubt that. So we thank him even in the hard times and the painful times. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Turn there with me, if you would, please. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. There it says, Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry. Be anxious for nothing. But in, in everything, by prayer and, supplic and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So in the trial, in everything, with thanksgiving, you let your request be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay, the tape has just flipped over. I'm going to wait a second. I'm going to read Philippians 4 again, for those who have the tape version. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, in it, you see, while you're in it, let your request be made known to God, and the peace of God should come upon us, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord, okay? Through Christ Jesus. Anyway, um, the next one I want to turn to is Ephesians 5.20. Ephesians 5.20, it says, Give thanks always for all things. That's one of the hardest verses in the Bible. There are an awful lot of things it's hard to give thanks for. There are a lot, of, a lot of people, even ministers, who would argue with me that that's somehow not what it says or what it means. But when you understand that we are in the body of Christ, that we're in Him, when you understand that He is aware of every little thing that happens to us, every hair on our head, that He's aware of every pain we're going to have before we even have it, and, you're, and when you understand that God is really good at being God, then we must learn to give thanks for all things. I preach to myself. I find that hard to do too. And I don't say this lightly. Even recently, I've been in serious pain as it appears my body is trying to pass a kidney stone. I'm thanking God for the stone, for the pain and in the pain, for His presence in my life, for His power to heal, for things He's showing me, and for healing me before I see the healing. But I'm still sometimes in terrible pain. This faith of a mustard seed that we're supposed to grow in lets us love, trust, and know God so well that no matter how horrible the health trial is, we thank Him for it and in it. Because He is really good at being God. He knows what He's doing. Yes, I've been there. Yes, I know it's hard. Brethren, you got to... When we found our little baby boy, our only son at the time, lifeless on our bed, I knelt on the bedside and I thanked God that he was there even in this. I said, somehow, some way, this is in your divine purpose and plan, so I thank you for the short little while we did have our son, your son, really, that you gave to us to raise, as a heritage from you, our only son. I don't understand, but I do remember brethren saying, saying, but I do thank you for being you, for being there, and help me understand why you let my little boy go. I'll confess that the next day, I still feel strongly about it. I did go through stages of feeling grief and anger and abandonment. But I tried to keep coming back to the quiet acceptance and thankfulness. And in this case, my son was dead. The pain was awful. The grief was unspeakable. And yet we also experienced, even in the horrible grief, a great peace beyond understanding. So much so the grave digger commented to us that he had never seen such peaceful parents in the burial of their own son. You may not have heard me whisper to my wife 
as he was throwing the dirt on the grave, on the on the coffin. It was such a small coffin. I said, I just want to jump in that hole with him. But then I said, but no, I can't, because he's going to need a father to come back to when he's resurrected someday. So back to the, you know, it was back and forth sometimes, but the, the peace was strong, even though the grief was also strong. Isaiah 26, 3 promises, he will keep in perfect peace, whose, he whose mind is stayed on him, because that person trusts in him. So if we trust God is working in us, we can be peaceful and thankful even in the pain and apparent lack of healing so far. But even as we thank and praise, watch out. Sometimes a dramatic healing is about to happen. So many miracles in the Bible happened after the people started praising and blessing God even before the requested help was apparent. Second Chronicles 20, the story of Jehoshaphat, is such a good example that when the people went out to meet the surrounding armies in faith, once they began to praise and sing and put the praisers in front of the group, not the, not the soldiers, but the praisers, God brought confusion on the enemy and they all killed themselves. Americans like to say, when I see it, I'll believe it. Or I'll believe it when I see it. Those of you who are children of the Almighty, don't go there. It's not that way. That's not His way. After Yeshua's resurrection, Thomas had said he would believe it only if he could put his fingers in the nail holes in, his, in Yeshua's body. And when Jesus met up with him, he taught a new and a better way of the kingdom of God in John 20, verse 29. John 20, verse 29. When he said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's the kingdom way. To thank our healer before we see the healing is demonstrating absolute belief, the kind Jesus speaks of, and an absolute trust that we know Yeshua and Yahweh, that the Yahweh is very, very good at being God. We must learn to believe before we see, and we must learn to thank Him before we see what we're asking for. We're giving thanks to Him in Jesus' name in everything we do. Let's look now at some another example. Turn with me to John 11. Very strong example here. John 11. And what did Jesus do? Thank God the Father after the healing? No, let's read it. John 11, verse 38 to 44. And then Jesus, again groaning in Himself, came to the tomb. This is the story of Lazarus' resurrection. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Brethren, before we will see any healing, we too must take away the stone of unbelief, whatever is the barrier to walking again with God. Take away the stone so Lazarus could come out in your life. What a powerful statement. It was a foregone conclusion that this son of man was going to be used by God to resurrect a man who, over whom hung the Paul the awful stench of death. Remember this Jesus is the same one who said he could do nothing of and by himself. Nothing. But by his Father he could do everything. He did the works of Father. And he said in John 14 that you and I would do greater works than he if we would but believe. And if we would ask in his name. We too are children of God. We too can do nothing, see nothing, be nothing on our own. Everything we will see in terms of healing will be from the Father, our dear Abba Father. Anyway, Martha, the sister of him who was dead, continuing now in John 11, the end of verse 39, said to him, uh, of him uh, Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? The same Martha, by the way, whom we sometimes think of in terms of Martha, Martha, you, you bother yourself with too much and your sister Mary's chosen the better thing. The same Martha had said earlier that I know that he will live. I know that you are the resurrection and the life, she said to Jesus. What a powerful testimony that she had made. Let's remember that Martha as well. 
maybe even instead of the other one. And then they took away the stone, verse 41, away from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried, Now understand what's happened here. The dead man's still dead. The appalling, the appalling stench of death still filled the air. Nothing had happened. Nothing had happened. And he's saying, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. When you have a little child that seems deathly ill on the bed and you're sick and worried sick about your child, start thanking God for that child. Start thanking God for his healing. Start thanking God that she is going to be fine. Start thanking God that you can thank God. Start thanking God that he is who he is. Start thanking God that he's so good at being God. Verse 43, And now when he'd said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Come on, you guys, loose him. Let him go. <laughs> I think <laughs> you, you had to be there. Uh, I, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure there are a few people who uh, whose skins were crawling right at this point. There's something about death and dead people. Someone told me that they used to be a cleaner in a mortuary and uh, you know in a funeral home and. These dead bodies would be here, and anyway, when he got his first night's job to sweep the floors and mop them and so on, he heard this. <laughs> he was right next to a corpse, and he heard this kind of sound. He just jumped out of his skin. He says, <laughs> "No one had told him that even dead bodies will ex exhale exhale a lot of, uh, I guess, fumes or whatever or gases." and make a, a, a groaning noise or, or a belching noise. <laughs> but anyway, just about crawled out of his skin, he said. Anyway, so you can imagine these people with Lazarus. So before the healing, well, Lazarus was very, very dead still. Yeshua was saying, thank you, Father, for having already heard me. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? And that's our example. And I think we if we start doing that, we'll start seeing more healings. When Yeshua multiplied the fish and the loaves, he did praise God. Did he praise God after they were multiplied? No, my brothers and sisters. He blessed the food of all earth. Still only five loaves and two fish apparent. In fact, I think that after he did that and he starts to break the fish and the loaves, I think there are always only in his hands five loaves and two fish. But as he broke them and started filling up baskets and handing them out, the five loaves and two fish kept being divided up. It says in uh, Matthew 14, verses 17 to 20. Yeah, 17 to 19, anyway. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. Five is the number of grace. He said, Bring them here to me. And then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fish, and he looked up to heaven. He blessed and broke and gave the loaves. See? He took five loaves and two fish, and then he blessed and thanked God. And then he broke them and started passing them out. Are we getting it? Probably even after the Thanksgiving, there were still only five loaves and two fish. But he believed and started breaking them and handing them out, as if the prayer had already been answered in the head. This continued over and over until everyone was fed. I personally don't think that suddenly there appeared dozens of baskets full of bread and fish. I think it was an incredible miracle. Our actions showing faith and gratitude have to be taking place before the healing is apparent. Naaman, the Syrian commander who had leprosy, had to humble himself and dip in the Jordan seven times even before anything seemed to be happening. It's a humbling of oneself that we're the poor and the needy as we thank God for something we still don't have visibly in front of us. But we know because God is so good at being God that we're as good as having. 
It's as good as having it. Praise and thanksgiving in the pain and in the crisis before we see the healing is the proper order. Start doing it. It's a marvelous experience. If you haven't been doing that, start doing it. You're going to absolutely love the way it feels. Paul and Silas in prison. What a marvelous lesson. Uh, they've just been beaten with rods. One smack would have been painful. Turn with me as I say this to Acts 16. Please be turning there. Acts 16, verses 22 to 27. Acts 16, verses 22 to 27. Can you imagine their pain, their wounds, their sores, the blood, the bruising, maybe even the broken bones, and then to be slapped into stocks in the innermost dungeon? Maybe they had broken noses. I don't know. Broken cheekbones. Who knows? How would you feel? Come on, admit it, brethren. Most of us would feel pretty forsaken by the one who could have protected us, who could have healed us, who could have delivered us. Where's God when we need him? Could have been something some of us could have said. But what did Paul and Silas do? It's written for our admonition and for our teaching. Acts 16, verses 22 to 27. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And I mean, with rods, brethren. You see the, the, the beatings of by the by the police in the, in the by the military in Iran against the protesters they have batons and sticks and they're whacking people over the heads and shoulders and arms hard that's what was going on here with Paul no doubt and Silas and when they had laid many stripes on them they threw them into prison threw them into prison commanding the jailer to keep them securely Having received the charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Here you are with probably broken bones, bleeding stripes, bruised backs and bodies, in a lot of pain, and you can't even scratch an itch, you can't move, you can't go to the bathroom, you've been locked in the stocks. So what did they do? Acts 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. At midnight, they were what? They were what? They were, <laughs> Acts 16, 25. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Brethren, are you still in some type of spiritual or emotional or physical prison? Would you like that prison you're in to be shaken to its very foundation? Some midnight hour in your life's trials, when you feel bound in a spiritual prison with zero options, unable to do anything, what should you do? Let's do what Paul and Silas did. In their pain, while still bound, while still bleeding, while still cut and hurt, they began to sing. They began to praise. They began to pray. And in that midnight hour, their chains were loosed, and they were freed. One of my favorite songs by the group Selah in their album Hiding Place goes like that. Some midnight hour. If you should find you're in a prison in your mind, reach out and praise. Defy, defy those chains, and they will fall in Jesus' name. We bless your name, that's what the song says, we bless your name. We give you honor, we give you praise. You are the life, the truth, the way, we bless your name. We bless your name. Why? Because God is so good at being God. He knows what he's doing. That's, that story is there to build our faith and to help us follow that example. This was not an unusual thing for them. They did what, what, what they normally did. They praised and they thanked God. They felt God's presence all the time in the good and in the bad. God is with you no matter where you are. Whether you're in prison or in heaven or on earth, God is with you. You can't ever escape His presence if you remain with Him. 
You can't go up to heaven and not, and not be there. Uh, you can't go down to the depths of the earth and God not know you're there. You can't go in the depths of the sea. You can't be in a dark room. You can't be in a bright light. That's in Psalm, I think, 139, isn't it? One of those Psalms that says, no matter where, where can I go from your spirit, O oh God? You can't. And then look out. You've just set the atmosphere in which miracles will happen more often. I thank you, Yahweh, our healer, for your wonderful ways and for healing me. In Yeshua's name, I rebuke this tumor. I rebuke this pain. And in his, and in his wonderful name, give you praise, honor, and glory. Whether we live or whether we die, whether we, we are yours. And may your name be glorified in all you do and all I go through with you. Thank you. Praise you, Father, that we walk through the valley of shadow of death with you. That should be our prayer. There's no cancer bigger than God. There's no pain, no heart disease, no malady, no illness. That God's name isn't more powerful than? That God isn't bigger than? I hate it when someone says incurable. Who said that? When a doctor told me, don't you go giving that mother of that little fetus that's just been born here in five months, don't go giving her mom any hope. She's not going to live. She's not going to live. Go leave this hospital alive. And I remember thrusting my finger onto his chest, and I said, "You're going to eat those words, in Jesus' name." That little baby is going to live, and she's a happy little teenager today. She is little still, but I hate it when someone says God can't. In the powerful name Yeshua of Yahweh our healer, we have victory and power over any disease or problem. Start thanking, start praising, start believing like never before, before, before you see the evidence of the healing. Remember the story of the ten lepers? Turn to Luke 17. I see now I'm going to barely have time to get into the second point, if at all, but the second sermon will get into all the other points into how we will have the healing from God. But this is a very important point here. How about the ten lepers whom Jesus healed? Have you read the story carefully? Jesus told them to present themselves to the priest. As they looked at each other, nothing had happened. But they obeyed, they believed, and, and they acted like they already were healed. How? By going to the priest while they were still lepers. And what happened? What if they had said, that's nonsense, Jesus of Nazareth. We'll go to the priest after we're healed. This is crazy stuff to go now as lepers. We're not even allowed near the temple as lepers. Come on. What kind of fool do you make us out to be? No, that's not what they did. In Luke 17, verses 11 to 19, let's read it. It happened as he went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, he met, he met their ten lepers, the ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, Go show yourselves to the priests. And so it was that as they went, as they went, they were cleansed. Now, it may not be that they had to necessarily go to the um, uh, temple, but um, they certainly had to go to a priest. And a lot of the priests would live out in the outlying areas, so that, that's probably what it's saying here. But anyway, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed, but where are the other nine? Were there not any found? Were, 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 uh, were there not any found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to them, Arise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So the point one is you act as if you believe. How many of us aren't being healed because we haven't rolled away the stone of unbelief? Because we aren't singing praises even while we're in our own midnight hour of emotional prisons. Because we want to see the healing before we start acting like we're healed, like the ten lepers. Start thinking, thanking, start praising before you see the healing. That proves your faith and that proves your belief. Anyway, the, that's the first big thing I'd like to see us be growing in. Track number five, final track we'll have today 
is this one here. The second big reason that we're going to have to really spend a lot more time on next time. I want to start it this time, though, because I want you thinking about this uh, in the few minutes we have left. This next point is one I almost never hear heard. I've, I've never heard in connection with healing or the lack thereof. The scripture is very clear about it. I spoke at length on it in a sermon just on this very topic, a whole sermon on it, in April 2006. Uh, on the web, the, the sermon title is Dramatic Healing, and it's tied to Passover, April 2006. I wasn't in that sermon talking just about the stripes of Jesus or being healed by stripes of the broken body of the, of the, of the uh, of Passover, but a lot more. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 to 32, this is the second point. <clears throat> Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 27 to 32. Therefore, whoever eats this bread, the Passover, or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Many sermons have been preached on that. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment on himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason... Many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. This is why many of you are sick, and many of you are dying of your sickness, because you're not discerning the Lord's body. Now, almost all the sermons I've heard on this talk about how we have to appreciate what Jesus did for us. That certainly is true. But I don't think that's really the focus that Paul is putting on here when you understand the context of what he said in the whole chapter earlier and in the whole book. For if we would judge one ourselves, we would not be judged, but when we're judged and so on. Why does Paul say even sleep or die? Because they're not discerning the Lord's body. What is the Master's body? <clears throat> Obviously, it includes his own literal body. But in context of all Scripture, the body of Christ is a reference to the church, the called out ones who have been given his spirit, who are in fact in him, who are part of his very body. Some of us are the hands, the feet, and I'm probably the armpit or the backside, and, and you're probably the face or the hand or the, or the wonderful thing that can be seen and acceptable by everybody. That's fine. But Colossians 1.18, Colossians 1.24, 1 Corinthians 12.27 and many other verses clearly state, Colossians 1, 18 and 24 are the, very clear. The, his body, which is the church, um, is very, very clear. We've given many sermons on that. What is the context of the whole book of Corinthians? The way we're treating and mistreating each other in the body. He taught them that they are the temple of the Spirit, that God himself resides in our bodies by his Spirit, making our bodies and each other and every one of whom uh, in whom resides God's Spirit, the very holy of holies, the naos of God's temple, in the inner holiest part where the Shekinah glory resided. In fact, more than just being His temple, we're actually His very own body. So are we getting it? I gave a sermon very recently that ties into this point hugely, and I, one of my favorite sermons that I've given, I hope you'll go back and hear it, I felt God directly inspired that as I explained in the sermon itself. Who is the least of these, my brethren? It's the title of it. Now, when I mistreat you, or you mistreat me, God's presence, I am mistreating God's presence with that disrespect. I am also treating Jesus himself if I mistreat you, if I despise you, if I don't welcome you, if I turn my back on you and you when you've come to visit me in your church, in our church, I'm doing that to Yeshua. Yeshua teaches us in Matthew 25 that whatever you do or don't do to one of the least of these, my brethren, 
he takes personally. You're doing that to me, he says. That's why when calling Paul on the way to Damascus, Yeshua asked Paul, 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 why are you persecuting me? Paul hadn't imprisoned Jesus. Paul hadn't tortured Jesus. So what, what was the point? Acts 9, verse 5. Why are you persecuting me? Are we getting it? Paul was doing it to the brethren, beating them, torturing them, imprisoning them, members of the very body of Christ. And Paul was doing it to Christ himself as far as the way Yeshua saw it, since those people were the very body of Christ. When you talk or act in a certain way, good or bad, accepting or refusing someone, loving or turning your back on a brother or sister, are the ways we're actually treating Yeshua himself, brethren. Gave a whole sermon on it recently, least of these my brethren. The King of Kings says he identifies himself with every single part of his body, just as you identify with your thumb, your face, or even your backside as part of you. It is you. If I mistreat your backside and kick it really hard, but I'm nice and I smile to your face, you wouldn't be happy with me. And I'd say, yeah, but I was that way to the backside, not to your head. So that's what we're doing in the church. We praise the head of the church, Christ, at the very same time we gossip and despise other parts of his body. James says it's incongruent. The same tongue would praise God and then curse brother with the same tongue. Jesus says the way we treat the person uh, we despise the most is, the, is uh, when we see him or her gathered among us is the way he sees us treating him himself. We cannot, brethren, see more healings until we come together more in attitude and spirit. We have not only splintered up as members of God's body into competing groups that have little or no contact, but we often won't fellowship with other ministers or brethren either. Many of you do. That's wonderful. But many of you don't. This cannot make Father happy. Because we're not discerning the body, many are sick. Many sleep. Some of us are very critical of other members in the body. Paul, Paul laid it on the line. God's going to provide the rain, the sunshine, as he does for everybody else. But the extra blessings like healing will come only when we please him. And it's not pleasing him when we talk badly about other members of the church over there or the ministers over there or the people over there. You know what I'm saying? When we won't cover the shame of someone's forgiven sin that has exposed them like a naked person, when we won't cover that, but rather gossip about it, God says, shame on you, and I'm not going to give you any more healing. So God, Paul made it clear sometimes, many times, uh, in fact, people are remaining unhealed, unhealed, not because of their individual sin, but because God is not happy with all of us. Brother, I'm out of time. I have to end it there. I have much more to say on this point and about four or five other points that if we practice them, I know we're going to see more healings. I just know it. So I'll end it there. In Yeshua's name, God bless you all. And I look forward so much to part two. I can hardly wait to get started. And I can hardly wait to get seeing more miracles and more healings in the body of God, in the body of Christ. God bless you all. Until next time, this is Philip Shields. Pray for me too, by the way. And uh, and as I pray for you. I love you, and I bless you, and I ask God that you would ask, ask God to bless me and heal me as well. Thank you, guys, and until next time, this is Philip Shields, your brother.